Good evening. On behalf of the Newark Public Library, welcome to tonight's Newark History Society presentation, The Morris Canal and the Business of Newark. I'm Tom Ankner, Director of the Charles F. Cummings New Jersey Information Center at the Library. Tonight, we are asking everyone to keep their cameras and microphones off. If anyone has a question or comment, you can enter it in either the chat box or the Q&A box. There will be time after our speaker's presentation for him to address these questions and comments. And now for more, <clears throat> excuse me, and now for more on tonight's program, I am pleased to introduce Timothy J. Christ. Tim is the president and co-founder of the Newark History Society. He is also a longtime member of the Newark Public Library's Board of Trustees. Tim. Oh, thanks, Tom. Um, I want to add my welcome on behalf of the Newark History Society. We are at 137 uh, participants tonight and counting, so this is really a great turnout. I think most of you know that the Newark History Society was uh, formed about 19 years ago with the sole purpose of um, encouraging new research and sponsoring public programs about Newark's more than 350 year history. Uh, we've done that through our sponsorship of the online Newark Archives project and through about 90 public programs of which tonight's program about the Morris Canal is just the latest. We're an all volunteer group and we're grateful for the support of the more than 200 members and for the cooperation of our partners, the New Jersey Historical Society, NJ Pack, Rutgers Newark, and not least the Newark Public Library. And here's where I should remind you that if uh, you have not sent in your $25 annual membership dues, or if you would like even better to become a member, <clears throat> you can do so via our website, the Newark History, Newark History <laughs> Society org, and click on the Join Support tab. But tonight's program about the Morris Canal is one that we wanted to do for a long time, and we're delighted that John Prieto can join us this evening. Newark was still a small town with perhaps 15,000 residents when the, Newark, when the Morris Canal was completed in 1832. And by connecting Newark to a source of coal, the canal helped to spark Newark's growth into an industrial powerhouse and center for regional trade, um, much of it to the south, which of course in turn drove the explosive growth in Newark's population in the 19th century. Our presenter, John Prieto, has deep ties to Newark. He went to NJIT as an undergraduate and spent um, most of his career working in Newark at the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities. Uh, he has made a close study of the Newark section of the Morris Canal and has tracked down a remarkable number of early photographs, which he will share with us tonight. If you have questions for John, uh, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen to pass them along and we'll get to them during the Q&A session. John, over to you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I want to, uh, Tim, I'm having a little trouble with the shared screen. Hey, Diego, you have to make John a co-host. <clears throat> Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> In the meantime, uh, Tim, I thank you for the opportunity uh, with, on behalf of the uh, Newark History Society for giving me the opportunity and Tom <clears throat> for, uh, from the Newark uh, Public Library for uh, sponsoring tonight's presentation. I'm honored to do it. Okay, I think we've got it now. Good evening, everyone. My name is John. <clears throat> I'm with the Canal Society of New Jersey. And again, I'm happy to be here tonight to give you this presentation. It's called the <clears throat> Morris Canal <clears throat> and the Business of Newark. Uh, but first, a quick look back at business, if you will, in Newark in the 1700s. <clears throat> Mostly it was farming, uh, things like cider making, uh, and <clears throat> of course, shoemaking, 
and leather and tanning, these two were part of what might be called home factories. Uh, this is where you had <clears throat> maybe five to 10 people working in a house or a building to make the products. By the late 1700s, <clears throat> Newark really became a, uh, a sort of a transportation hub. <clears throat> of course, it had access to the Pasig River uh, and several docks, ferry access. And sometime in the 1760s or 70s, <clears throat> a road was created heading east with some bridges to get over the rivers toward New York City <clears throat> that came out of the old Plank Road. Early 1800s, <clears throat> the profile for Newark, um, it was upgraded to include things like wagons, carriages, hats. <clears throat> uh, there was a good reputation after a while for Newark made products. And they noticed that exports of Newark products were going up. Hey, John. Yes. We're so getting a note that some people are having a little trouble hearing you. So again, right. if you can uh, up your volume or put your microphone a little closer to you, that will help some of us. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks. I do have it fairly close. Is that a little better? Oh, that's better. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, good. Sometimes it shifts down. Um, <clears throat> okay, so population was increasing. You had, uh, with that, more skilled labor. And basically, uh, the important part of that was the industry was, in the work, was shifting <clears throat> beyond self-sufficiency and home products. Uh, but manufacturing was still a very slow process. So really, uh, Newark needed a catalyst to grow. 1822, the Mars Canal as an idea. Uh, the canal really was a <clears throat> vision of a waterway to help industrialize northern New Jersey and the New York City area by as Tim mentioned, bringing coal from the Delaware out to the Hudson. So this is what uh, <clears throat> the typical canal boat looked like. This is a longer one. The, the earlier days, they were shorter. <clears throat> this particular boat had a hinge in the middle, <clears throat> which allowed it to get up and down over the inclined plane. So this location is up uh, by the colleges, <clears throat> up off of the old Summit Street. And of course, you can see two areas where they would store the coal in the boats. All right, a little timeline. <clears throat> uh, the canal began in general in 1825 uh, out in Morris County. <clears throat> the surveys for Newark were not done until 1828. Uh, so by 1829 and 30, construction was still ongoing in Newark. And believe it or not, they really did not know exactly where it was going to end up and what the route was going to be. <clears throat> but they did manage to complete a portion of the canal in Newark by 1830. So the canal in Newark <clears throat> it, uh, did have some hurdles to get by. <clears throat> Uh, a couple of them were getting the right of way secured, and of course, the construction and later on enlargement. <clears throat> now, the way the canal entered Newark, uh, it came from the north and west. <clears throat> so, it basically had at some point uh, in Newark, it had to turn east toward New York. Now, and also the original terminus <clears throat> was supposed to be in Newark. And the other problem that <clears throat> they had to overcome was uh, differences in elevation. Newark was not flat, at least not where the route was. <clears throat> okay, here's a <clears throat> classic 1806 map. Uh, this shows the downtown area. It's got the main roads and some of the property owners. 
the red line that's superimposed is the final route of the canal through Newark. So you can see they had to cut through many properties. This is a reproduction of the original field survey for Newark of the Broad Street area. Uh, again, down the middle, you can see the canal route going through Mulberry Street. <clears throat> and again, a close up of some of the property owners with their names Mrs. Johnson, George Holden, Dr. Clark, et cetera. So, all those properties, they needed to get approval for the canal to pass through. All right, a big picture map of Newark. <clears throat> The black line is the canal, almost seven miles. So again, it entered up in the Northwest at the Belleville line. And as you can see, it went pretty much due South, but there's that turn it had to make to head East, right in this area. That is actually up by the colleges, NJIT and Rutgers. You can see the little arrows they depict the devices that were used to overcome the elevations, the inclined plane and the several locks <clears throat> that needed to be installed for the canal to drop down to sea level. All right, so Newark as the original <clears throat> canal terminus. That meant <clears throat> that <clears throat> the canal was going to be landlocked uh, this didn't sit well with a lot of business owners and, frankly, the, the city of Newark. So the canal at some point <clears throat> was going to extend east. So they made a deal. They said, in exchange for you to continue your construction through uh, east, heading east into Ironbound, uh, you, you give us access to the Pasega River right away. So that, was, that became Block 18 East. You can see it right here in the middle. So that the boats could have access to the river. They could fly their wares to New York and pick up supplies, etc. The locks were numbered east to west. Um, the center of the state started with number one. And as they headed east, the lock and plane numbers increased. So, of course, New York is at the end of the line, more or less. So it had the higher number. Uh, elevation profile for the canal in New Jersey, you could see Delaware on the left, Hudson River on the right. The higher bars are the higher elevations. That's in the area of Lake Apacon, which became the source of supply for water for the canal. And that fed both east and west. You could see Newark over to the right with the gold arrow. Almost at sea level, but it needed to drop down a little further. Here's a close up of Newark elevation coming out of Bloomfield and Belleville. You could see they had a drop some 110 feet before it hit the Passaic. The 70 foot portion of that is the inclined plane. Okay, so conquering the elevation differences. This is how they did it. In most cases in Newark, they used locks, which basically allowed the canal boat into the back, open gate, close the back gate, <clears throat> open the front gate, and the level of water would equalize with the forward position so the canal boat could go through. So that was good for about a 10 foot difference, but the inclined plane was used in Newark to overcome a 70 foot elevation difference. That was also up by the colleges with the big hill. The inclined plane, <clears throat> the way that worked was it took water from the top, raced it down the flume, down the penstock, turned the turbine, which turned the drum, which pulled the cable, which was attached to the cable car where the canal boat would slip into at the bottom and the action of the turbine would pull the canal boat and the cradle car <clears throat> up and down. 
So again, a 70 foot uh, elevation drop uh, for plane 12. So these are some of the pictures <clears throat> of the locks and the plane as they were in Newark. This is lock 16 on Lock Street, appropriately named enough, right by NJIT, my old alma mater. Plane 12. Okay, you see it's double tracked. The way the turbine mechanism was set up was that they could have one boat going up and one going down simultaneously. <clears throat> that saved time and moved cargo faster. People who are familiar with Newark, you see the big hill here. You may recognize that as uh, when you drive west from Broad Street, that's where Raymond Boulevard is now. About a thousand feet long. And again, elevation difference of about 70 feet. Hard to imagine that then. Okay, continuing east, lock number 17. That had an elevation drop of a little bit more than 10 feet. It was about 18 feet. This is down by where Raymond Boulevard is, where it meets Route 21, roughly. You can see at the bottom of the picture, the canal forks. Uh, to one side is the aforementioned Lock 18 East to the river. And the other leg is the continuation of the canal into Ironbound. This picture dates to about 1870. You can see the wagon here. You still see a boat up top. Lock 18 East. I have to say this was a long time coming. I only saw this picture for the first time recently. <clears throat> this is where uh, the canal opens to the Passaic River. Across the river, you could, this is a later picture <clears throat> after the canal was abandoned, but it does show you how it looked across the river to Harrison. Off to the right are the bridges that take the trains over, and I think the path. So heading east into Ironbound, uh, Lock 19 was the last 10 foot drop. That was by Ferry Street and Blanchard. And Lock 20 actually touched the Passaic River. So that was more or less a guard lock, what they call that's where the canal boats were set free into the river on their way east. Okay, in the beginning, this is from the Niles Register from 1829, reporting that boats laden with wood and stone have arrived in New Ark from the northward up by Meads Basin, which they say is Morris County, but it's actually the Wayne area. That meant that it would have had to pass through Little Falls and work its way all the way back down through Bloomfield and then Newark. And so <clears throat> coal was not necessarily the first product <clears throat> that was shipped on the canal through Newark. Okay, a little more timeline. <clears throat> 1830, the first iron ore was shipped to Newark. And it wasn't until 1831 that you had the first full cargo of coal that reached Newark. Uh, this neat little announcement is from the Newark Sentinel from 1832. It does give you an idea of some of the products that were shipped on the canal in and out of Newark. I see coal, of course, firewood, iron. I see fish, miscellane miscellaneous merchandise, etc. Okay, <clears throat> this is a summary of uh, the benefits of the Morris Canal in Newark. Okay, coal was pretty much number one. That was brought in to fuel businesses. Uh, employment and uh, increased and higher standard of living. 
transportation costs were reduced. You had access to new markets. <clears throat> it also created additional businesses and competition. Of course, the labor force became more, more skilled. Costs of production uh, were lowered. You actually had businesses set up to help other businesses. Uh, nearby streets and roads uh, became developed a little faster and coal became cheaper. And the main coal that was shipped to what's called anthracite from Pennsylvania. This was a cleaner burning coal as opposed to bituminous <clears throat> or charcoal, which was a lot dirtier. So that's one side effect that Newark experienced was uh, cleaner air. Okay, so coal, big business in Newark. Uh, you had 21 coal yards in Newark. They were big storage areas. And you had five industrial uh, coal handling facilities. Some of those were further east. Of course, many coal users. And Newark was prominent enough to have a Lehigh agent in the city. And also a coal exchange office, which I believe was on Broad Street. So here's a map of Newark, um, canal in blue. Coal yards and coal dealers are plotted. Of course, you can see they pretty much hug the canal, as you would expect. Uh, the dispersion of <clears throat> these yards uh, tilted more toward the left, which was uh, where a lot of the smaller uh, coal-using industries were. Further east, you had larger industrial companies, and some of those had their own storage facilities right on the property. Uh, here's a sample of a coal bill of lading. This is from 1901. Uh, this is actually for a yard in Patterson. <clears throat> but you'll note that it's for the account of the Newark office. Here's a neat ad I found in the Newark Sunday Call announcing the availability of coal by a Mr. Kenneth on Orange Street with his associated branch office on Market Street, Mr. Peter Mellick, who was later a uh, canal employee, had his own coal yard right on top of the canal that was good for his business. He was on Plain Street advertising the best qualities of Lehigh and Scranton coal. Always on hand. Speaking of coal boats, <clears throat> this picture is north of Bloomfield Avenue at what appears to be a coal yard. It's tough to see, but you could read Lehigh in the back and a taller sign in the middle um, where it says coal. Here's the canal boat, either just loaded or about to load up. If you'll notice off to the right <clears throat> where the shrubs are, that is the future location of the Newark's Branch Brook Park. And in between, you can see the rundown pathway. That is the towpath where the mules were uh, walked and pulled the boats. I love this picture. <clears throat> this is the foot of Plain 12, Raymond Boulevard. This canal boat is already in the cradle. It had just come out of the water and it's about to go up. And you can see in the hold, <clears throat> they have what appears to be coal or it could be stone. And it, I, I believe that uh, <clears throat> this was a fascinating mechanism to many people, because every picture I've seen always seemed to have people looking around. In this one, you see a lot of kids hanging around. They must have been fascinated. OK, so beside coal, there were other products that were shipped on the canal <clears throat> in and out of Newark. So uh, flour was common, <clears throat> produce from the west 
logs, cordwood. They also shipped animal hides for processing. The occasional order of whiskey, <clears throat> black powder. They had to be careful with that, no smoking. Uh, construction materials, brick and lime. They even shipped ice on the canal. Now that was uh, from the West or even locally. And fertilizer and manure. That generally went West to the farms. Since you had a lot of mules and horses in the city, uh, it went to good use out West. And the occasional load of sandstone which were used um, at, uh, in some Newark churches and the old jail. Here's an old receipt for goods shipped through Mr. T.V. Johnson, who was down by the docks by Lock 18, 1840. It's very tough to read, but I could decipher a few items, fish, coffee, candles, Silver Lake, Silver Lake section of Newark, heading out toward Belleville. Uh, that actually, uh, that location was used to harvest ice at one time. <clears throat> so they would load it on the boats and ship it out. Sandstone, now this is my picture from a few years ago. This is the back of the old jail, which is still standing. And you can see all the sandstone that was used to, to build the, uh, the building. Actually, there are multiple buildings there and it's been vacant for a long time, but it is still standing. And down below, you can see the tracks, which is where the canal passed through and is now the city subway. Okay, so the canal was able to create business opportunities uh, grocers for uh, people on the canal boats. Steam engines were made at one time by Watson Campbell <clears throat> in Newark, used by some of the companies on the canal. Tools for the leather industry. Uh, the many dealers who, who uh, plied coal and wood. Fairbank scale company actually was in Newark at one time and they actually had a way lock, uh, a, way, a way mechanism at lock 16, which is up on lock street. That's so they could weigh everything and make sure that uh, everything was, was uh, as, it, as advertised. And even in the early days, uh, packet leisure boats were riding on the canal. Okay, here's a couple of maps of some grocers. <clears throat> Robinson, He's, he was located on 71 Lock Street. You can see where his location was, right on top of the canal. And Mr. Hallinan was on South Canal Street over by Lock 17. Again, right on, right on top of the canal bank. The key word here was proximity. Business to business. We were talking earlier about uh, Jay Wiss, maker of cutlery. This is a receipt uh, <clears throat> of stretchers, they called it, which were used to work with leather. Bought by uh, Mr. Howell from T.P. Howell, which was the leather manufactory. Bought of Jay Wiss, 1863. So they bought seven, Mr. Howell bought seven stretchers for $6. Uh, packet boats, you had two that I'm aware of, the Maria Colden and the Emmeline. Uh, they ran round trips to, uh, from Newark to Patterson uh, for a few years. And you can see this depiction of the Maria Colden actually riding in the cradle car <clears throat> up the inclined plane. I believe this one was supposed to be in Bloomfield. 
All right. Here are the cold boat movers, the mule team. They are standing for uh, their uh, 15 minutes of fame with their handler, with the canal boat in the back. And you can see the tow line. The mules are standing on the, what they refer to as the tow path, which was the flat path next to the canal <clears throat> where the mules would walk and pull the boat. They also serve Newark. Okay, so we're gonna take a little tour <clears throat> along the canal from the north and the, east and the west as we head east. Here's uh, one of the businesses that was uh, a user of coal on the canal, Hooten Coco. You can see the boat there by the, uh, <clears throat> by the dock probably just loading, unloading some, uh, some coal for the Hooten Coco operations. You could see the, the boom off to the left, what they used to call a, a gin pole or a gin boom, I believe, to help unload the coal. Here is a uh, Sanborn map. This actually shows uh, Hooten Coco right on the canal banks and the blue arrow is pointing to the storage where they would keep the coal for, for their use. Not too far away from them uh, <clears throat> was the Hedden and Nichols hat manufactory. Uh, they were big users of coal that was delivered by the canal. You could see actually they had a dedicated spot to store the coal here at the coal sheds. Uh, we talked about the Whist factory. They were in different locations, but at one point they were on Littleton Avenue. You can see their big factory. Uh, they were not very close to the canal, but <clears throat> there is documentation that uh, they received steel for their cutlery from Rockaway along the canal, uh, as well as coal to run their factory. Okay, we're heading toward Lock Street, uh, Smith Leather. They processed uh, hides that were delivered on the canal and also coal. The arrow to the lower left is uh, pointing to the basin. That was a wide part uh, of the canal where they had room where boats could pull over to the side to load and unload. This is a nearby property of uh, Smith Leather Manufactory. Uh, this shows them <clears throat> with the process hides out and drying in the sun on racks. Okay, as we swing around the bend here from Smith, uh, we see T.P. Howell. They're the ones who bought those stretchers from Wiss. They had a big property, big leather uh, manufacturing outfit. Mm -hmm. They also received hides and coal via the canal. Here's a nice colorful map showing T.P. Howell around the bend. T.P. Howell was, a part of their building was actually right, but if you look at the lower left, right by lock 16. Uh, moving to the right, you see the wider part, the basin. Swinging around, we pass Smith. And if you'll notice at the top, that's where the Essex County Jail was. That actually predates T.P. Howell by a few years, I believe. So the jail even had a good view of the, uh, of the canal. Okay, moving along, <clears throat> we're swinging back around from Lock 16. This was the turning point as it headed toward Plane 12. You can see the building to the right is right on top of the water. 
and many buildings in the background. So we're heading into the industrial area here. This is a great close-up picture I found of a canal boat with miscellaneous items heading down the incline plane with a few onlookers. Okay, heading toward Washington Street. Here is the Bannister uh, Boot and Shoe Manufactory. Again, right on top of the canal, you can see toward the middle, the canal boat. Now the arrow points to a smaller steam tugboat, <clears throat> which it's believed that that tugboat was used to pull boats, canal boats occasionally <clears throat> through the inner city uh, because the space was so limited for the, uh, with the buildings that the towpath was either limited or non-existent in some areas. Okay, moving further east, we see uh, the Schmidt Coal Yard. They handled a lot of coal. They had, <clears throat> which was not the usual case, they had a power coal mover and tramway, which helped get the uh, coal off the boats, <clears throat> up and over to their yard for storage. So here's a picture of the canal right by the Schmidt Coal Yard. You can see how high the, uh, the Schmidt's facility was. It actually had an elevator and a conveyor that lifted it back up <clears throat> off the boat and onto their, into their storage yard. This, uh, this particular picture is interesting because they had to <clears throat> lower the water and drain it out to make repairs to the walls, which were caving in. Okay, further east, we see uh, Ripley and Sons Timber and Lumber. <clears throat> As you can see, they had a big operation. You could see the river in the back and a depiction of the canal <clears throat> on the other side. Uh, the Sanborn map uh, bears that out. Off to the right, you see the river. They even had a little slip for, um, for boats to deliver items. And to the left is the canal. So Ripley was in a good spot. He had access to great transportation. Ripley received uh, unprocessed logs and um, <clears throat> processed them on, on site and also coal to run their machinery. Another neat old picture passing by Ripley's uh, property. You can see the, uh, the mule team pulling the boat. Okay, a little further east, you had a big operation, Baalbek smelting, where they refined uh, precious metals. Baalbek also had, <clears throat> uh, it was in a great location. They were next to the canal and the river. Another Sanborn map. You can see they had the canal first, a little bit of property and then the river. At one point, they even had overhead trams to help carry products back and forth from the canal to the property. So this is Baalbek, I believe off to the right, the mule team pulling the boat. And you'll notice there were a lot of overhead bridges. They were either pedestrian bridges or bridges that carried uh, process pipes or water lines.
Okay, further along, uh, New Jersey's Inc. They were in Ironbound by Chapel Street. They uh, <clears throat> received iron ore on the canal from the west, zinc ore rather, mostly some iron, and also uh, coal from the canal. So you could see they were big enough where they had internal uh, tramways that would deliver from one side of the buildings to the other. Nearby was Riley and Son Leatherworks. Again, very close to the canal. Now the blue arrow uh, calls out the um, storage they had on site where it says coal pile. Okay, so we can go ahead and say that the Morris Canal in Newark, <clears throat> you might consider it what they call an agglomeration economy. Uh, that meant that there were economic advantages uh, with the canal in Newark. Uh, businesses wind up clustering near the transportation. Uh, first, that was the canal, <clears throat> later the railroads. Uh, they eventually experienced lower costs, transportation and production, more skilled workers, as we mentioned, and <clears throat> more interdependent businesses. This all led to the growth of Newark. Here's an example of interdependent businesses, uh, proximity to the canal. They are plotted out as, as such. Uh, L is uh, for leather manufacturers and T of the associated, associated tanneries, uh, they're all right near the canal and next to each other. That led to other interdependent businesses <clears throat> such as hats and shoe and boot manufacturers. This may be one of the early examples of urbanization. Again, a colorful map of the extreme downtown area by the city dock in Lock 18. Uh, in effect, <clears throat> the Morris Canal in Newark acted as a magnet. And you can see the big mixture of business, uh, residential, stores, and transportation. Okay. <clears throat> I compiled a few relevant statistics about the canal in Newark and its influence. Uh, <clears throat> as Tim mentioned earlier, the population increased uh, from the period when the canal more or less was under construction to 1851, <clears throat> the 25-year period, the population in Newark went up five times. And <clears throat> between 1840 and 1850 doubled. 1826, 80% of the labor force in Newark was involved with manufacturing. That's a pretty high number. Uh, number of business establishments between 1830, about the beginning of the canal in Newark, up to the doorstep of the Civil War, 469%. And in the 1860s, which was, uh, it was really a peak time for the canal. Factory capacity utilization, near 100%. <clears throat> Hard to fathom. So other industries in Newark uh, that were dependent on the canal, uh, A.W. Kenny, they made change for the inclined planes at one time. <clears throat> Alger Company, uh, they made castings for the planes, iron castings. At one time, uh, canal boats were built in Newark. Uh, and the India Rubber Works, they actually used canal water at one time for their operation. That became a source of... Uh, friction later on. 
Here's a map of India Rubber Works right near the inclined plane. And you can see the various uh, pools of water and access that they had. This is from 1868. Okay, <clears throat> as it turned out, the canal was a great wayfinder in uh, advertisements. You can see the gold arrow is talking about uh, Gould machinists. You notice there's no address here. All it says is in inclined plane of Morris Canal. So since most everybody knew where the canal was, they were sure to find Mr. Gould. <clears throat> All right, a couple of uh, <clears throat> Newark profiles for you. Uh, August Kroger, <clears throat> he was a canal boatman and his son wound up being a grocer nearby the canal. Peter Mellick, we mentioned, he owned the coal yard and <clears throat> was a supervisor for the canal near plane 12. David Ripley, you saw, <clears throat> owned a big lumber yard. George Compton <clears throat> was a shoemaker, one of many. Uh, he plied his wares right near the canal. Harvey Hatch, <clears throat> this is back in the early days. He was up by lock 16, he was a brick maker. And TV Johnson, who we mentioned, <clears throat> dock master near lock 18. He also was a, a grocer. The common thread is they all lived in Newark. Okay, here, <clears throat> here's a panoramic of the downtown area. You can see the canal off to the right. A lot of canal boats waiting off to the side. Lock 17 and 18 at the bottom. Well, you could see how, uh, <clears throat> how many buildings there were right nearby. Now a close up of that picture <clears throat> reveals a building which apparently seems like it was built right on top. <clears throat> and it was, it was the Newark Center Market. They actually built it right on top of the canal, 1853. Uh, this is where they handled produce from the West. <clears throat> so the building, as it turned out, <clears throat> besides serving as a city market, also had spaces for uh, city government offices, and I believe even a small jail. Market Square, this was right next to the center market. And what looks like a very busy work day. Many people in wagons and horses, I'm sure with lots of produce. This is right on top of Mulberry Street. Another little interesting building built further east right over the canal was the old oyster house. And this was part of the challenge of the canal in Newark. It's dark under there. And it was. Here is um, a boat <clears throat> north of Broad Street. Again, very narrow, little or no towpath. You can see the <clears throat> The one the man on the canal boat over on the left, he actually has a pole with him and he was pulling the boat and pushing it along <clears throat> because there were parts of Newark where the mules could not, could not walk and pull the boat. Off to the right, this is just at the Broad Street Bridge. And I believe this was the area where the mules would stop at the bridge and they would have to be led up over the bridge <clears throat> and back down because there was simply no room on either side of the canal bank. Uh, for reference, the canal width <clears throat> was 32 feet as designed. 
<clears throat> Later on, the, when the expansion came, they were supposed to go up to 40 feet, but I don't think they were able to do that in a lot of parts of Newark. There just wasn't any room. Okay, this is down in Ironbound. You can see the canal team, uh, the, the mule team pulling the boat. <clears throat> they are on a very thin strip of towpath. To the left is the canal. To the right is the Passaic River. So there was little room for error. Another narrow space. <clears throat> This is up by Plain Street. Again, <clears throat> with the buildings where they were put, very limited space for the mules to go through if they could go through at all. Um, okay, so after the Civil War, <clears throat> The first trains transporting coal across New Jersey were really in quote, competition with the canal. Okay, so coal prices from Mount Junk, which is where a lot of the coal came from, <clears throat> to Newark via the canal have become at last more expensive than by train. And so, <clears throat> There was a shifting influence um, <clears throat> of coal in Newark relative to the canal. A quick timeline, <clears throat> 1847, you had almost 30% of <clears throat> Pennsylvania coal shipped along the canal that was delivered to Newark. By 1870, two thirds of the coal from Pennsylvania was shipped out to Tidewater went right through. By the mid 1870s, more coal was shipped by rail. And a greater amount of coal was shipped by the uh, related Delaware and Raritan Canal, <clears throat> as opposed to the Mars. And by the 1900s, uh, <clears throat> with the railroads taking over, there were more what they called coal pockets that were put in place in Newark. An example was um, a coal dump storage area down by South Broad Street that really became the controlling factor of the trade. So here's a <clears throat> graph of uh, total tonnage on the canal and coal mid 1800s to 1900. The orange graph peaked at about 1866. That's for everything. But you can see over the years, <clears throat> total tonnage on the canal was going down and down. But coal as a percentage of the tonnage actually was going up. So there was still use for the canal relative to coal. Speaking of which, <clears throat> here's a later photograph of a canal boat. About 1915, with the mule team pulling off to the right. Again, this is up by the Branchbrook Park area, off to the right. By that time, the park, I think, was pretty much open. Okay, so with the good comes the bad. There were some side effects of the canal in Newark. The physical landscape uh, was altered. <clears throat> the canal really cut the city in half. What it did was create a lot of dead end streets. There was the need for bridges one of which was on Washington Street, which was later referred to as the Washington Street Hump. Local businesses uh, and consumers were very upset that they had to keep crossing over the 
<clears throat> the bridge to get from one side of the canal to the next. Uh, the canal produced uh, incongruous mingling of industrial and residential. That was a problem for city planners years later. And the canal uh, also led to uh, excess pollution, especially in later years. And the canal was like anything else that needed to be maintained. It had occasional breaks and was subject to repairs. So the bridges over uh, the Mars Canal in Newark, you needed about 20 substantial bridges. Some of them were even stone arch. Here's one down by the gas works, down by the foot of Market Street. So there was some arguments about who was gonna <clears throat> put them up, but eventually the city of Newark agreed to, uh, to arrange for them to be installed and maintained. Here's a bridge at Halsey Street in not very good shape. Here's a more substantial one <clears throat> in later years. Uh, Hudson Street, this is up by Central Avenue. And so what you had was a real concentrated uh, patchwork with the canal in the city. Uh, <clears throat> a real mix of uh, the canal itself, stores, domiciles, and industry all commingled and bunched together. This is a dramatic picture of a canal break. What happened here, I believe, was the canal wall had, a, had suffered a break. It was a cave in and they actually had to drain it to make the repairs. This is on Canal Street. You can see the Oyster House, by the way, in the background. And <clears throat> of course, once the water came out, you could see all the pollution, all the detritus that was had sunk to the bottom. So I'm sure they took the opportunity to clean it out before they refilled it. Okay, so Newark and the canal was also um, the site of many groups that used the canal for different activities. Uh, at one time, the Civil War Regiment was located near the canal up by Roseville. Uh, you had the Newark Camera Club. Their outings included the use of the canal boats. At one time, there was an agent <clears throat> It is reported that served uh, as a spot for the Underground Railroad. We believe that was Mr. T.B. Johnson. Uh, the waters of the canal were used occasionally as a baptism site. And of course, canoeing, uh, fishing spot, <clears throat> especially up by Orange Street, and a swimming hole. Here's an updated plaque, Camp Frillinghausen, of the regiments that were up in Roseville by Orange Street and Bloomfield Avenue. I believe they actually used the canal for recreational purposes and swimming. Now this picture is uh, striking. This is the camera club on an outing. They happen to be in Montville but they sure look like a leisurely bunch. Just coming up off the inclined plane. This picture is a little grainy, um, but it does show the kids fishing at Orange Street. 
about 1908. And a swimming spot. I believe this is up by Central Avenue. Big crowd. Okay, uh, 1906. The canal still had a little life in it. They built this contraption, which was an unnumbered inclined plane, a very small one. But they built it uh, <clears throat> to have the canal boats come up out of the water, ride over the railroad, and back down into the water. That was the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western. Uh, at one time, the canal actually went under the DL and, and W tracks. Unfortunately, the tracks had to be lowered because in 1902, there was a severe accident. Uh, where students were killed who were riding a nearby bus that collided with a train. So they had to do something. And this is what they came up with. This plane, by the way, was um, <clears throat> not hydraulic. It was electrically powered. And what it did was it allowed the canal to keep, op uh, keep operating for several more years. The kids seem fascinated by the mules. Uh, but reality set in by the late 1800s. You had encroachment <clears throat> uh, from many directions, other modes of transportation. Uh, there wasn't much in the way of canal boat business. Uh, even city planning, uh, they were all closing in on the canal. This is the uh, incline plane, plane 12. It actually is crossing the high street trolley tracks. And there was a gate there to avoid collisions. The railroads. They were already closing in and taking away canal business. Here's one down the ironbound, crossing right overhead, almost touching the water, it seems. 1902, work on the railroad down by Market Street. Uh, it appears that they had to work near an arch, which was over the Morris Canal. So they had to work around it, if you will. So the, uh, the walls were closing in. Branch Brook Park, by the late 1890s, construction of the park was underway. Canal was still operating. Now you can't see it, but the blue arrow points to a fellow who's there next to the canal. He was the canal watchman who was brought in to walk the path and make sure that uh, the canal was still intact while they worked on the park over to the right. Okay, <clears throat> this is the end. By 1922, the state officially took over the canal. Uh, 1924, the canal was officially abandoned, which meant that there was no more navigation. And so the late 20s, <clears throat> they set out to drain the entire canal. This picture is also quite dramatic. <clears throat> this is the water flume that fed the turbine on plane 12. You could see the sorry state that it's in. So Newark <clears throat> did not know exactly how to use the canal through the city. It was stated, though, that they wanted to use it for <clears throat> internal transportation of some sort. It's another dramatic picture. 1929, here's an inspection crew down in the ditch. 
near Norfolk Street. Again, <clears throat> you could see that the canal, it's drained, but it's, it's just full of detritus. Sad to see. So there were many ideas on what to do with the canal, such as a high-speed train or even a, <clears throat> a water supply route. But what they decided was <clears throat> to go the way of transportation, and that was the beginning of the Newark City subway. This picture is the, uh, <clears throat> the city subway under construction, right on Raymond Boulevard. And you could see it's heading west where it's going uphill. So the canal <clears throat> did not serve uh, as the route for the city subway throughout the entire city, only from the Belleville line to Penn Station. And they actually built the city subway tracks right in the canal bed. So the canal had a so-called second life. And of course the subway is still in use today. So they decided to commemorate uh, the days of the canal and they came up with several tile mosaics, murals that I believe are still in some of the subway stations. Excellent work. Here's a canal boat with the captain at the till. I went ahead and added a few <clears throat> comparison pictures. Here is the Smith leather on Lock Street back in the day. Here's a picture I took on the right of pretty much the same location. You can see the tracks where the canal used to be. But instead of a leather factory, <clears throat> You have a parking garage and a dorm. Such is progress. Here's a neat before and after. This is the top of plane 12 on the left. Looking east, you can follow the canal <clears throat> water almost all the way down, two tracks. Here's the same picture years later with the old cars riding up and down, same perspective, but <clears throat> Raymond Boulevard uh, still serving as a major transportation route in the city. So <clears throat> the canal now serves um, <clears throat> as a greenway spot and these days it's always open for greenway business or potential business and that's it okay well thank thank you john that was terrific uh you know i had made up some i I'd come up with some questions of my own just in case nobody asked any questions but we're we're not going to have to use any of my questions because we got lots of questions here. Okay. Uh, okay. So let me uh, let me give you some of these. Um, do you know how the construction of the canal was financed? The, uh, it was, <clears throat> I believe, it was a joint effort between um, <clears throat> business and and municipal or or the state. It's a little fuzzy as to how that all worked. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, the canal was a, uh, also a business and they did sell stock. So they did have investors. Mm -hmm. So that was a big part of it. Okay. Um, was eminent domain used to acquire land for the canal in Newark, do you know? That is also a good question. I, I know that term and I, have not seen documentation that said that specifically, but I believe that, that it was used. There were payments made to the landowners. Uh, later on when they expanded, <clears throat> uh, they went ahead and um, 
again, they were using, except in name, they were using eminent domain to give them the right to go ahead and put the canal in and set up any appurtenances to that end. So they were doing it without saying it. Yeah. What do we know about the workers who dug the canal for Newark? Do we know where, where uh, were, um, were they of a certain ethnicity? Um, they were, yeah, they were mostly Irish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a lot of them came over. <clears throat> they, a lot of them were Irish, and they they dug most of the canal, if not all of it. Um, it was a <clears throat> a matter of contention because they they had to have a place to live, and a lot of them lived in poor conditions. A lot of times they were in shanties, and Newark, I believe, a lot of them were down by Ironbound. Again, not great conditions, and. Um, not much pay. I think some of them got maybe a dollar a day. Uh, but yeah, mostly Irish. Um, the Cal, the canal route has interpretive markers in several towns to the north and west. Yep. Other than the, other than the mosaics and the city subway, what interpretation <laughs> can be found in Newark? And might, what might you want to see? Tom, I don't think that um, there are many. I go down to Newark occasionally, uh, and I really don't see much in the way of, um, of markers. Uh, there may be the occasional sign, say on Raymond Boulevard, further down toward Ironbound. Um, up by the colleges, I don't recall seeing any there. There is a piece of some of the, <clears throat> by the jail, that I visited uh, where there's some empty space. So there were some discussions about maybe putting a small greenway there and some signage. Uh, but uh, from my uh, perspective, there's not a whole lot. And as far as extant uh, sections of the canal in Newark, little to none. Yeah. Okay. Are there any, uh, are there, um, do we have any heritage buildings or preserved architecture or have we lost all the structure? Yeah, <clears throat> Tom, I think everything is gone. Yeah. Um, I, I know there are two, there are um, a couple of buildings that the uh, Newark Landmarks has been looking at, um, getting some protection for. There are a couple near Lock Street. There are a couple of 19th century yeah. buildings that are now offices. But I think other than that, there really isn't much. There You're, really isn't. Now you mentioned Lock yeah. Street. When I was up there, I believe the, why the old T.P. Howell leather industry, mm -hmm. there is Lock Street Apartments. Now, someone mentioned that inside they have some kind of sign commemorating the canal, uh, but it's not very visible. Mm, okay. Um, was Newark's coal mainly from Pennsylvania? Yeah, for the most part. Uh, back in the early days, uh, I suspect that they got coal from other sources. And again, a lot of that was the bituminous type or charcoal. Um, some of the coal may have come in off of ships that I'm not sure where they would have gotten that from, uh, but <clears throat> mostly from Pennsylvania. Which came first, the Morris or the DNR Canal? They were about the same time. Uh, the Morris started construction in 1825. And I think the charter for the <clears throat> DNR was about the same time. So it's close. I forget the dates. Okay. I think the Morris was a little ahead. Okay. Um, Okay, well, I asked that. Let's see. Um, what's the connection with the Newark City subway? I mean, you talked about this in your uh, presentation. What's the mm -hmm. connection with the Newark City subway, Branchbrook Park Canalways, and the Morris Canal? Uh, you, re you did talk about that, but somebody had asked that question earlier. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> the, uh, the canal, as it came from Belleville, it, uh, it went south. Uh, and it, before I left Belleville, it, Branchbrook Park started, and that 
the uh, the canal followed the park space uh, pretty much down to Orange Street. Okay. So I believe the park uh, respected the canal when it was doing construction. Uh, and even after when it was drained, uh, they left it empty until they came up with the subway. But they were right next to each other. Yeah. Okay. To ship merchandise on a barge along the canal, what steps did a merchant have to take? Um, and was it a select group? Um, how much did it cost to transport a load of coal, flour, et cetera? <clears throat> um, the numbers are a little fuzzy to me. Uh, they did have to pay some tolls. Uh, and they went by weight. Um, you can see that old receipt. I forget what the number on there said. Mm. But it did go by weight. Okay. And the merchandise, we did see the one receipt um, for perspective. It had miscellaneous items on there. I don't know how much it weighed, but the total amount was a little over $2. Okay, all right. Um, were the canal boats owned by the Morris Canal Company? Uh, mostly, yes. There were some canal boat owners that owned it themselves, but <clears throat> throughout the life of the canal, it generally was tilted heavily toward boats being owned by the canal company. Okay. What propelled the boats across the Hackensack rivers? Were the mules transported on the boats as they crossed? They did have, um, no, <clears throat> they did have uh, tugs, if you will, that would bring them across. They first had to get across um, the Passaic over to Kearney, where they had an open channel. And then they would be pulled by another boat over the Hackensack toward Jersey City. So that's how they did it. Um, there may have been some steam tugs involved, but generally they were they were pulled by other boats. Yeah. So now you, you talk about how narrow the uh, canal was in parts of uh, Newark that it went through. But other than those portions, were the canal boats typically pulled by two mules? Yeah, they <clears throat> mostly mules. I believe at some point uh, they used horses on occasion. But um, and of course, as you saw in Newark, there was the rumor where they were pulled by a steam tugboat occasionally, uh, but mostly mules. And I think because of their temperament, they were better at it than horses. Hmm. Okay. Um, did any of the uh, businesses or factories discharge waste into the canal? Yeah, for sure. Uh, hmm. I read a story once where they talked about uh, up by uh, the jail, uh, they and they wrote a story about how uh, T.P. Howell, for example, which was the leather manufacturer, uh, they <clears throat> were discharging uh, waste right into the canal. Hmm. So uh, that became an issue in the late 1800s. And for some people, one of the reasons why they wanted to close the canal, because it was so polluted. Yet it was still being used as a swimming hole. <laughs> yeah, in some spots. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the narrow canal um, in Newark was it due to the fact that adjacent buildings predated the canal? Uh, <clears throat> the buildings that we saw in the pictures, that's not likely. For some reason, they allowed the buildings to be built right next to the canal. So business being what it is. Uh, so while the canal width may have been close to the 32 feet, it did cut into the, the um, towpath. And so the, in certain spots, the mules could not be used. Okay. Um, well, you mentioned that there, there were breaks in the canals from time to time and they had to be drained. What was the source of water for replenishing the water levels in the canal after a break? They would have to, uh, <clears throat> I believe they would have to start bringing down water from, from up north and they would have to transfer it back down <clears throat> and go ahead and fill the, uh, and fill the canal that way. Oh. There, there wasn't much written about that. 
in, in my research. Uh, but yeah, eventually they would have to refill it from the higher elevations and just bring it down. Newark had uh, a couple of big breaks, 1840 something, and I, <clears throat> I believe in, eight, in the 1880s. And again, you saw the one down by Canal Street where they actually had to, I believe, drain it on purpose to make the repairs. Sometimes it was weather related. Mm, okay. So is this material that you presented to us tonight and everyone's very impressed by it, um, is it available online anywhere? This is not, this is my own PowerPoint, if you will. Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe it's being recorded. So anybody who wants to it see is. it again, yes. Yeah. You could certainly see it again. Uh, yeah, well, a, lot well, of the yeah. picture, a lot of the pictures, of course, are <clears throat> from different websites, um, certain libraries. Okay. Yeah, I noticed, it, I noticed you had a lot of pictures. I mean, uh, where, what were some of the sources of uh, information for the pictures you used? Well, you, <clears throat> you can always start with the internet. A lot of it is posted. Mm -hmm. Not all of it is accurate in description. So you have to kind of know. Um, other sources would be uh, other materials. Sometimes people post things on social media, uh, pictures I've never seen before. And, you know, some old history books and even old photographs that um, I think they have at the Canal Society. <laughs> I've seen some of those. Hey Tom, this is uh, Tim. Let's let's one or two more, maybe about the depth of the canal as designed, and maybe about the Underground Railroad, and then I think we need to uh, bring this to a close. And, and okay, uh, so let's. What about about the Underground Railroad? What what's known about the uh, the role? Very little. Um, I I saw the uh, Barbara Colada book <clears throat> where they talk about how some of the slaves may have been moved through Newark. And that one of the agents down by the docks supposedly <clears throat> was helping them uh, onto ships and to get out of the area. So there's not a whole lot known about that, but I thought it was enough to make mention that that could have been going on. Okay. There is anecdotal evidence, if you will. <laughs> got it, got it. All right, so back to you, Tim. Thank you very much, John. This was yes, terrific. Thank you, Tom. And this will be available on the um, on the library's uh, Facebook. It'll be available on the Newark History Society's YouTube, and I believe we will we may also have it on the library's YouTube as well. Okay, so back to you, Tim. Yeah, John. One of the uh, drawbacks of a webinar format is that we can't all uh, uh, clap at the same time and let you know <laughs> just how good this was. It, it, I, I can feel it, Tim. I appreciate it. Yeah, just an awful lot of questions and 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 um, and comments and such. So thank you, and we're very grateful. Yes, thank you, Tim and Tom, and thank you, everybody. I enjoyed it, and thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, we will be posting this on the Newark History Society's YouTube site in just the next couple of days. So uh, the Newark History Society's next program will take place on Monday, March first, um, hosted by NJ Pack this time. Uh, we'll discuss some forgotten Newark riots in 1834, 1854, and 1917. Uh, the topic is a lot more timely than we suspected when we put this program together, given the mob at the Capitol three weeks ago. Uh, there have been mobs throughout Newark history and American history. Um, so please join us then. Again, if you want to get on our list, send an email to NewarkHistorySoc, S-O-C, at gmail.com. Um, hope to see you then, and thank you for joining us tonight. Good night.